First on BBC4, can we look beyond our comfortable convenience lifestyles for the sake of the planet? The Selfish Green, with Jonathan Dimbleby. We're talking about the loss of whole ecosystems. We're talking about the disappearance of everything we have known in certain parts of the world. And, and I don't think I'm being over dramatic. Dramatic. What we're talking about requires uh, uh, very big changes and which will require people not just paying lip service but really believing it is too and putting things behind it. Now, that means that they ought to be converted. They ought to actually think that the natural world is precious. 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 If you did a, a census of all species on Earth at the moment as to which species would be the best one to disappear for the future sustainability of the planet, it would be yes. us. 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 If astronomers told us that a comet of the size of the one that destroyed the dinosaurs is heading our way, presumably the whole human species would start pulling together and would start getting their heads together, having meetings, trying to think of ways of averting the catastrophe. 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 Our world is threatened by environmental catastrophe and crippled by our own greed. Are we really too selfish to save it? In The Selfish Green, four leading campaigners debate the issues. Every two years, the international community of wildlife filmmakers migrates to the city of Bristol for the flagship festival known as Wild Screen. One event that has captured the imagination of every delegate is an environmental debate with an enigmatic title held at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre. Welcome to the Old Vic for a mega discussion which is about nothing less than the future of life on our planet. The challenge has been set by Wildscreen, which is the biggest gathering of natural history filmmakers you'll find anywhere on Earth. And I can think of no panel better able to face the challenge of debating these issues than the distinguished quartet we've got here. Richard Dawkins, eminent interpreter of Darwin, author of The Selfish Gene, and therefore, of course, of our title this evening, The Selfish Green. Oxford University's Professor for the Public Understanding of Science, Richard Dawkins is an outspoken polemicist who's often courted controversy. In his first book, The Selfish Gene, Richard radically reinterpreted Darwin, forcing us to rethink how we see ourselves and the world, focusing on gene selfishness, the idea that organisms exist solely to reproduce their own genes. My life is about studying natural selection and explaining natural selection to people and the power of natural selection. In many ways, it's the first wonder of the world. Richard Dawkins believes that as the most powerful species on Earth, we will have to think long-term, overriding our selfish genes to become altruistic, not only to save other species, but our own as well. Sir David Attenborough, wildlife filmmaker emeritus, if he'll take the phrase, and someone I know needs no introduction to this audience. Sir David has done more than anyone else in the world to promote a love of nature. His first BBC wildlife series, Zoo Quest, led to a lifetime of natural history broadcasting. The Emperor Penguin. Sir David has witnessed many dramatic changes to the natural world. And though he's reluctant to preach conservation, his State of the Planet environmental series revealed his thoughts and concerns. The future of life on Earth depends on our ability to take action. Surely we have a responsibility to leave for future generations a planet that is healthy and habitable by all species.
Jane Goodall, who's devoted much of her life to campaigning for the survival of the great ape species, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, and now more widely is campaigning for the United Nations as an ambassador, a messenger for peace. Jane Goodall has changed our perception of what it is to be human. With her research on chimpanzee behavior, she's challenged old definitions and assumptions. I don't think anybody could fail to believe that chimpanzee infants and human infants have the same kind of emotional needs and emotional expressions. As a young woman, Jane traveled to Africa to study chimpanzees at Gombe Reserve on the banks of Lake Tanganyika. After 18 months of patient observation, she helped catch a new chimp behavior on film for the first time. A PhD and over 30 years of research ensued. She now travels the world with her Roots and Shoots project, educating young people to support and sustain their natural environment in 87 countries. And Richard Leakey, the world's most renowned paleoanthropologist, and who now argues that we're threatened by what he calls the sixth extinction. Richard Leakey has worn several different hats to make his unique impact on the world. He's been paleontologist, anthropologist, conservationist, and politician. He's helped to change our understanding of human origins. His digs near Lake Tucana found bones of some 400 early humans. He's ensured the survival of elephants in his native Kenya. And he now strives for change in the political arena. In 1989, President Moy asked Richard Leakey to head the Kenyan Wildlife Service. It was facing a crisis. 85% of Kenya's elephants had been lost to poachers. He took them on and won, initiating a ban on the trade in ivory. What he did was burn three million dollars worth of Kenya's ivory. Through his books and lectures, Richard continues to bang the drum for environmental conservation. We live, of course, in a world that is alarmed by global terrorism, disfigured by global poverty, and threatened by environmental catastrophe. It happens to be my belief that we don't often recognize enough that these three apparently distinct phenomena are very closely linked. In large measure, it's self-evident that our species is both the cause of the problem and its potential solution. So I want to start, if we may, with the, with the challenge that we face, the question of survival. Coming at it from your particular perspectives, how great and what is for you, Richard Leakey, the challenge? I think one has to be very careful um, not always to present the negative. And I have to say that the ability to change people's attitudes and the, uh, the whole positive approach that something can, in fact, be done may be a more useful way to go into this in, in, in future. And people say, well, what do you mean? Well, part of our problem is poverty, human poverty, and part of our problem is human ignorance. And both of those conditions were manifest in many parts of the what now so-called Western world just after the Second World War. And many people in this room and others will remember that the Thames was filthy, the cities were dirty, you couldn't wear a, a white shirt like Richard's for more than a morning without having to change it for the afternoon. Today, many of our cities are really quite clean. Many of our rivers have been restored. And if you go to, to Western countries, the green movement is very real. It wasn't 20 years ago. If this can be done in that half of the world, can it not be equally possible to do it in the rest? And I think it can. Jane Goodall. Well, what's happening to this planet with the environmental destruction, the pollution, the threat of global warming, and on top of all, and this and, and many other ways in which we are harming the environment with our uh, chemical pesticides and fertilizers, and we can't really think about addressing any of the environmental problems unless we first address poverty, but we have to address them at the same time because I don't think we've got time to wait. 
and, and ignorance, absolutely ignorance, which means that people think one way without ever having been given the opportunity in the right way to open their minds, where, where people have lived without the sun of knowledge coming through to them. And that makes them uh, bigoted and it makes them fundamentalist because they haven't ever had an opportunity to think differently. David Attenborough. I think the, the big question that faces the world is how long the human race is going to increase in numbers. Um, it can't do so indefinitely. Um, the fundamental cause of much of the poverty of which you've been speaking is, is the number of people that are in a particular area. The fundamental cause of the mass destruction of the environment of great parts of the world is in order to uh, allow for the increase in numbers of people. Um, the fundamental cause of some of the appalling, tragic uh, uh, disasters and famines is because too many people are trying to live in too small an area. Um, the world is finite. It cannot take an infinitely growing number of people. What you can demonstrate is that, that so often one of the best ways of decreasing the population growth is to increase the material wealth and economic wealth uh, of, a, of a community. Richard, how do you come to this from your perspective? There are some mistakes that people can make, that we can make, which are correctable later. And there are other mistakes which are irrevocable. And one of the things about um, worrying about the future of the, of the world is thinking about those, those things which can never be undone, like the extinction of some species or, worse, the extinction of some ecosystem. So these are very serious problems, if only if you, you think in terms of the irrevocability. When we think of things like poverty, when we think of things like uh, overpopulation, and I agree with everything that's been said, we presumably have to try to identify those places where the interests of the human population and the interests of wildlife and ecosystems can somehow be, be made to, to, to go together rather than be conflicting with each other. Is there some way we can manipulate things such that we have a non-zero-sum game that everybody can be the winners? I'm not entirely optimistic about that because it seems to me that in many places the interests of the human population are very hard to reconcile with the interests of the wildlife population. But some of the people I respect most are, are trying to uh, bring those two apparently conflicting interests together and I hope they succeed. Are we talking about uh, protecting all species on Earth or, given that some have already gone, do we say, yes, yeah, some can go? <laughs> well, I, I think quite clearly there are an awful lot of people living in the world today who are in no way connected or benefiting from the vast majority of species. I don't think there are any people living in the world today who are not connected in some way tied to the survival of a healthy planet. Uh, obviously, the health of the planet is largely determined by the, the availability of natural ecosystems and broad biodiversity. It gets particularly difficult to, to, to single out in individual issues, and I've often raised the question, are we any worse off today as a species for having no woolly mammoths and rhino in Europe and North America? And the answer would have to be, no, we're not any worse off. If we're not, Will we be any worse off if there are no leopards and lions, cheetah and elephant and rhino in Africa? Probably not. But if we lose them because of an attitude to the planet, and if in so losing them that we, we're reflecting a disregard for the context of, of, of life and development and the future of our own species, then I think we should be very concerned indeed, and we can't afford to make that mistake. But it's, it's, a, it's a very awkward position to to have to take, but I would think we should be as, as clear-minded as we can about spending huge amounts of money saving single individual species that clearly are now 
tightly restricted to small areas and looking at the broader frame of ecosystems. If the, if the chimpanzee disappeared, the orangutan disappeared, the gorilla disappeared, would we in any fundamental way, in terms of the survival of the human species, uh, be worse off? Well, I suspect that our descendants, realising that on our watch, these amazing relatives of ours were just allowed to vanish, they might be a little distressed, or perhaps they would only be present in zoos. If you did a, a census of all species on Earth at the moment as to which species would be the best one to disappear for the future sustainability of the planet, it would be yes. us. There's no question about that. And, uh, you know, but, but it seems to me there are three insoluble problems, each of which we must solve for a future that we would be happy to leave for our great-grandchildren. And the first, absolutely, is we've got to level off our population. We have to. And secondly, we have to try somehow and reduce what the elite communities around the world believe that they need, because that's not sustainable. And, you know, it's E.O. Wilson who says that if every human being on the planet today acquired the level uh, of... What do standard I mean? of living. Standard of living of the ordinary, not the extra wealthy, but the ordinary person living, um, in, particularly in America, we need four new planets. So we need, we need somehow to persuade people that life isn't only about money and stuff. Life is about more. We need people to find a meaning and different values in life so that they make do with less and have what they need but aren't you know, always reaching for what they want, which they don't need. And no. thirdly, yeah. the third point, is we have to alleviate this crippling poverty that's everywhere around the world and somehow persuade them not to yearn for what we have now, which we have to learn to do less with. So they seem insoluble, but if we can't solve those three, then it's going to be tough to solve the environmental ones as well. Population, overconsumption, tackling poverty. We'll come back to, yeah. to, to those. But David, just for, for a moment, sticking with the, 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 the why do we bother about species, um, is there a tendency for us to care about, as it were, one says uh, disparagingly, the, 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 the cuddly ones or the big and beautiful and dramatic ones? And isn't there a case of saying they're actually rather less important than the invisible ones in the earth? Yes, I'm sure that's right. If you say, um, well, shall we save the mountain gorilla or shall we save um, a, a small flea that happens to live uh, somewhere in Rwanda? Nobody's in, in doubt, of course, but that's a false uh, opposition. It, we ought not to be thinking in those terms. We ought to be thinking of nature as a unity. The, the fact is that it, it's easier to focus on a particularly charismatic thing. But actually what we're wanting to save is, is not a species in that strictly limited sense. You don't save a Javelin rhinoceros if you put it in a concrete pit and keep it fed. and That is no longer a, a Javelin rhinoceros. W what we have to do is to save ecosystems, the entire complex, fantastic, ungraspable, incomprehensible, marvellous accumulation of interlocking organisms, plants, fungi, animals, insects, mammals, birds, the lot. Um, and, and that is actually the surest way of saving the Sumatran rhino. That's the point. So that the, the best route to conservation is to save ecosystems. That's what we've got. Should do. one be struggling to keep species alive that um, are not central to the ecosystem that you have to maintain for human life to be possible? If I may say a paradox, everything is central. Uh, you know, uh, there are very few things that you can eliminate without having completely unthought of circumstances and re repercussions. Um, and uh, what it make, of course, it makes life easier, really, because you can see what the problem is. It isn't a question, I wonder how we've really sorted out whether, in fact, the egg production by this particular species is dependent upon a protein which comes from... No, f save your time. What you wish to do is to save that coral reef, that tropical rainforest, so, that set of deserts. So when you see, as we do see, that um, not at a dramatic rate in all species, but in some species, you see uh, the, the gradual loss of that species, disappearance, threatened species, elimination of species, 
every single one of those, from your point of view, is a serious diminution so, of the potential for long-term survival on the planet. And the ones we notice are the litmus paper, nearly often. On the face of it, from what we've just heard, it's a pretty grim outlook. If you apply the pure selfish gene interpretation that you do of, of Darwinianism, humans have the power. They are the most intelligent of all the species on the planet. Um, but the gene, if I understand your usual account of it, um, means that we as humans think short term and cannot think in the future long term, and therefore, paradoxically perhaps, are instrumental in our own downfall unless there is something more to the gene than, than I've outlined it. Um, the, the idea of the selfish gene, which is just another way of putting Darwinism, yeah. it's a kind of genetic way of putting, putting Darwinism, is that all living creatures are uh, machines programmed by their genes to survive and propagate those genes. There has never before in the whole history of life been anything that you could call foresight, caring for the entire world, caring for an ecosystem, caring for the survival of a species. That's just a non-issue in Darwinism. But Darwinism has given rise to the human species, which is unique, which has a brain which is sufficiently large that it's capable of leaving behind the selfish history which gave rise to it. So I think the human species is utterly unique. I think that for the first time ever in four billion years of evolution, there are at least some individual organisms on this planet who actually care about the future of the planet. No other species has ever cared about the future of the planet. The, they only care about the future of their own offspring, etc. But th that involves an, a, a, an analysis or interpretation that the human brain is capable, which is what you're saying, I think, of overriding the sort of ultimate objective Precisely. of the selfish gene. And it's, it's quite clear that there are at least some human brains that are capable. <laughs> That's what I was... And, and there's the rub. Uh, but, because it, but at least those... Those some, maybe it's few, maybe it's more than few, demonstrably are capable of caring for more than the survival of themselves and their offspring and their selfish genes. That gives hope that one might be able to persuade a large number. I, I want to pick up on you, Richard, for one second. And that is that chimpanzees um, actually are capable of true altruism, not just... Um, saving the lives of their immediate kin or even their sort of second immediate kin, but of totally non-related individuals, even individuals they didn't really know very well before they were rescued. So that it just shows that this evolution, this leapfrog, actually starts just before us. Yes, no, I, could I just come Thanks, back yeah, on, yeah. on that? I, I gave the wrong impression if I suggested that we were the only species capable of non-kin-directed altruism. What I did say is that the human species is the only one that's capable of taking action in the interests of the long-term future. Yeah. And that, I think, probably is uniquely human. Taking, taking action because you've worked out that in a century's time, some dis or in 20 years' time, some disaster may befall if we collectively don't. That, I think, is unique. The thought that actually you're saying is that they can, we can look long-term, or some of us can look long-term, means that the, the problems of population, conceivably, the pop problems of poverty, problems of material overconsumption are problems that can be tackled. But, I, mean, I, I think we've got to be very careful we don't get slightly into the ether over this. Um, I, I'm very concerned that if, if you're going to get a human response to, to, that is, if you like, extra-genetic, this, this bigger view of the value of the planet, you can only do so from a position of security. If you haven't got, at the end of the day, a certainty that you can eat, if you haven't seen clear water since you were born, if you have absolutely no idea of the next time somebody starts to cough whether he or she will die, it's pie in the sky to be talking about extra genetic behavior, it, it has to be very selfish. 
And this is why I feel that, it, uh, that the, the attack against poverty is very real, and, and, and I think we've got to understand. But I think there's a positive side to this, and I think we've got to recognize that whereas in, in, in California or perhaps in, in, in Britain, extra genetic behavior is part of a democratic process where people will express this bigger view and push the politicians to do things. And the, the role of the filmmaker, if you like, and the, and, and, and the writer, is therefore to create this, this popular vision of what needs to be done so the leadership can pick up. And in the third world, it's not like that. In the third world, you still have a very small number of people who determine the future of their countries. And it's much easier to persuade 100 people to take positive actions on environmental issues than it is to persuade 100 million. And I think there's a lot more that could be done through the political process. And I don't know of any government official, any organization in, in, in public management, who will opt for something that makes the environment worse. They will opt to do nothing, or they will opt to take a short-term short solution. They don't go out of their way to say, let's destroy the environment. No, they go out of their way to say, let's destroy the environment if we're going to make a lot of money. Exactly. Individually, yes. And that is why we have to find a solution to poverty. Or, or if we're going to win the next election. I mean, yeah. what, what implicit, almost implicit in what you were saying is, if the world was run by uh, a, a few wise dictators, we'd all be better off than... I'm quite sure of that. You are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, takes, which, take, which, 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 takes, which takes me actually just by way, of, by way of example. I mean, you faced the real tensions in Kenya when you were in charge of the parks um, in, in saving the elephant for its own sake and for our sakes more broadly. Um, the poachers were in there because there was money to be made and they, I presume, very many of them employed or were part of the, the problem of great poverty. Um, you took a very tough line and you got rid of the, effectively got rid of the poachers, but that is a short-term solution to a long-term problem. How do you, if you take, just by way of sort of concrete example, the game parks, um, and the people who have ever-expanding um, need for land, who have ever-expanding aspirations, who have ever-expanding industrial development, cities growing at a dramatic rate. How do you resolve that conflict? I think one of the things we have totally failed to do, and which I don't know necessarily the answer to, is, is we have to give nature, we have to give ecosystems, we have to give what we're trying to conserve a value. A monetary value. A monetary value. Uh, governments can't look at a balance sheet and see expenditure against an item that has no value. And I think one of the, the, the failures in economic thinking is that we can value, if you like, an object of, of alleged beauty like a Picasso, but we cannot value the Serengeti, except in terms of whether tourists go or, or don't go. And tourists sometimes won't go. And I think to pick up on, on, on what was said earlier, there will be many years ahead when there will be no tourism in, in, in Serengeti. Some ghastly incident has happened somewhere in the world and people don't go there. So politicians say, well, if that's the economic value, it has none. But it's not who sees the Picasso that makes its value, it's the Picasso that's valuable. And I think we've got to get a new mindset into people on this issue of value of, of ecosystems. Honestly, Richard, it seems to me um, a marvellous idea, if you could bring it about, and maybe you've got ideas, practical ideas, as how you could. But I can't see myself going to somebody, in, uh, a politician in South America, let's say, and say, look, your rainforest is extraordinarily valuable, um, unless you say, I have come through the United Nations or some global organisation, and rich people will pay you to keep it. That's the only way I can see you can bring that situation about. They won't do it in vacuo. They won't go to their, their own electorate, many of whom are appallingly impoverished, and say, we're extraordinarily rich. But isn't there, isn't, excuse me just a minute, no, but isn't there a possibility, if you think back over the last 100 years, that you can, in fact, change attitudes through political process? How long ago was it that slavery was accepted in the city of Bristol? How long ago was it that people were not concerned about human rights violations if it didn't affect people you knew? This is a learning process, and there's absolutely no reason, if we're right, that these ecosystems have a value that goes beyond the borders of our individual countries. 
This is a global responsibility to look after these well, things. Well, then that's fine. Can we not then make that an issue as we did human rights? Absolutely. But in, in, the only place to do it is in an international global organisation such as the United States. But then States. why aren't we doing it? I, this well, is what I think is necessary in the 21st century, to okay. change the paradigm. Let, let me jump in here. I, I was just in Costa Rica. And <laughs> Costa, Rica, Very good. Costa Rica, as you know, abolished its military. And that has meant that all the money that was used for the military has been used for social issues, social development, and for the environment. It's the only country I know of that has got the rights of the environment and living things as part of their constitution. And, of course, the model is so tantalizing. If the world gave up its military, there'd be no more poverty. We'd have money for everything. And all the things we're discussing now would be unnecessary. But the, the problem is that while you have powers and nation states and fear and greed, yeah. the selfish gene in its raw form, you don't get that kind of, that kind of, of altruism. We have made advances. We have now reached a stage where just about everybody in the world thinks that slavery is is um, beyond the pale, cannibalism is beyond the pale, um, various other things that, that used to be accepted and one would have said just as pessimistic, oh you'll never get rid of slavery, how could you possibly get rid of slavery and, and we've done it. So I, I do think that, that there might be grounds for hope. I could just tell one little uh, story arising out of Richard's um, point about the um, Picasso. Um, Wilson has a nice, E.O. E. Wilson has a nice um, uh, way of putting the economic p point, which is that the, in the, um, uh, the, the Amazon r rainforests, so much of the, of the sort of goods are up in the trees and so little is in the soil at any, any one time, that to knock down trees in order to turn the land into agriculture for a very short time, it, he, I think the way he puts it is, well, you can make a living doing that, but it's rather like burning an old master to eat your, to cook your dinner. Yeah, exactly. I just happened to have been very recently in Ethiopia where, with the help of the international institutions, um, there is reforestation. It's not going at the rate to keep up with the growth in population, therefore there's still an erosion, but there's reforestation. And it's illegal now, despite the country being the poorest country in the world, heavily dependent, if you're a poor peasant, on wood for heating and for building. It is illegal to take down any trees, and there are serious um, penalties. You know, you go to court and you're, and you're fined if you do it. And it gets out quite quickly, because if farmers know they're short of water, because there is um, practices which are eroding the soil, um, they quickly wake up and know there's a problem. They may not have the solution at, at, at hand. But that's exactly the problem. I mean, it, there was a land commission that I organised when I was uh, head of the civil service in Kenya that went around the country registering people's concerns about the land in Kenya. The, the, the staple diet in Kenya is a type of food that has to be cooked to be digested. And if you haven't got access to energy that you pay for, then you have to use the energy that you pick you up. See. And you pick up firewood or you make charcoal. Now, this is why I think poverty is such a, such, such, such a central issue to this. I don't think there's anyone in Kenya who would say that we don't want to reforest the land. There's nobody that I can think of on a, on a broad scale who would say it's a good thing we have to cut down all the forests. Everybody's desperate to save what we have, but how do we do it in the face of the fact that more and more people can't cook a meal at the end of the day? Well, then, could, could the problem be solved by throwing money at it? I mean, if you, if you could actually tax Americans and us and, and, and pay for fuel that was not local firewood, would, would that solve a, a well, big... I, I think if you gave everybody in Kenya a point of electricity with, with, a, with a burner stove and one bulb, you'd reduce forest depletion by an incredibly large factor and have enormous positive results on water catchment and, and the regeneration of healthy environments. And there's no doubt, I mean, if you, if you talk to, to UN of, uh, officials, they will tell you that if the rich countries got up their share to 0.7, which is the UN target of GDP spent, on development aid. If you actually had a trading system which meant that um, more money went to the poor countries rather than it being brought back here through subsidies and tariff barriers, if you reverse that, you would make a fantastic difference simply on a monetary basis. You would be doing exactly what you said. 
Right. Jane. Um, yeah. Gombe National Park, where the chimpanzee study is, is very tiny. It's only about 30 square miles. And when I flew over it 15 years ago in a small plane, um, I suddenly realized the extent of deforestation outside the park was it, shocking. It happened fairly fast. It happened partly as a result of the villagization, Ujima, partly as a result of refugees pouring across the border from Burundi. And it wasn't that some trees had gone, it was that basically all the trees except in the very steep ravines had gone. And that led to a program initially funded by the European Union that we called Take Care, T-A-C-A-R-E. And it, it's quite a holistic program. We began with 12 villages. We're now in 22 and about to be in 34. And it's a program which starts off with in each of the villages where the program is, is tree nurseries. It's um, growing woodlots. It's conservation education for kids and for adults. It's primary health care delivered through the regional medical authorities because it's never been a program with very much money. It's concentrating on women, improving their self-esteem, scholarships for gifted girls so they can go on to secondary school because it's been shown all around the world that as women's education improves, family size drops. Um, providing family planning, AIDS education and various other things. And it, the reason it, it was picked up so well by the villagers is because this was not a group of white people going into a black African village and saying, we're really sorry you're so poor, but we, can, we, we want to help you and this is what we're going to do for you. It was rather going in with a sort of menu and saying, here's a program and these are the kind of things that we could help you to do. And has that changed attitudes well, towards the chimpanzees? Totally. We're using um, firewood, Richard, but from the woodlots, which are close to the village, and these little stoves made by the Canadians, which are very, very fuel efficient. Which takes me on to um, what is arguably perhaps the, the greatest immediate and obvious environmental uh, threat, global warming. Richard, how do you do you have optimism that the capacity of the human brain to override the genetic disposition of the selfish gene um, can so affect, for instance, the President of the United States, that this would come <laughs> onto the agenda more effectively? Take more than that. <laughs> well, you haven't chosen the most ideal example. To... <laughs> uh, I... No, cl clearly not. I mean, th there are, as I said, there are people of goodwill and altruism in the, w in the world, and there are people in important offices running the world, and the two don't necessarily coincide. And that's an understatement for the example you've just, just raised. <laughs> um, I was very, uh, very encouraged by uh, Richard Leakey saying that just a, a bit of money... To, to, to supply every, every peasant in Africa with, with the wherewithal to, to cook the food and not need firewood would make a dramatic difference. Um, if that were generally understood, I suspect most of us would... I mean, how, how much would it actually amount to in the, in the way of a, a tax on each one of us? Not a lot, would it? I think it's a much bigger question than, than whether you give free handouts of energy... By, by everyone saving a little here and giving it over there. I don't think anyone wants free handouts. But how do we get food to where people are hungry? How do we get energy to where people have none? And I think one of the things that environmentalists have got to discuss and, 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 and reconsider, and I'm quite sure I'm not going to get any support from the panel here on this one, and that is, in, in the history of humanity, only one type of clean energy has been found that is cheap, and that's nuclear. And if you go to South Africa, they have a fuel excess that is so large that fuel costs could be considered for giving out this free light bulb and free electricity without any problem. We tried to go the route in many African countries of, of, of hydro. With climate change, and I hope there'll be time to discuss climate change in, in, in this discussion, it seems to me that that's not the way to go for energy. Without energy, 
of the, of, of, of the sort that can be obtained through wire or through tube, you're going to lose charcoal, fuel wood. And although, as Jane says, on a, on a micro basis you can do something about this on the large scale, I think we haven't got the time. We all need to reconsider. Given what we now know about nuclear energy, is it not time to revisit and say, OK, we didn't get it right the right, the right way the first time, but nonetheless the enormous potential of that energy source exists and it could change the face of the planet if we did it properly. You don't, you don't, you don't think, just to, before we open this up a bit, you don't think that a combination of wave power, tidal power, wind power, um, solar. solar power of course. can do it? Of course. I think we've got to look at alternative sources of energy, cheap, clean energy, and get on with it and stop... I won't say the word I was thinking about. <laughs> we about, got it. About, you know, F about. <laughs> if there was... The people who know about these things could assure one that there was a way of, of, of really making it safe of really dealing with the byproducts, of course, how could we not say it would be marvellous? But we haven't got that at the moment. Richard, then, against, against that background, um, do you have a picture in your mind of what, if climate change continues at the rate at which it looks as if it's going to, without the preventive action we've just touched on, what impact that will have on the species on the planet and how that will affect the human species. Do you have a clear picture in your mind of that, of what it might be? It's not clear. But let me, let me say this. From a paleontological point of view, and having looked at, at species in, in the African geological deposits going back 20 million years to the present, what is very clear is that climate change has been with us before, yes. not induced by humanity. And whenever there has been dramatic climate change, as opposed to small fluctuations, there are dramatic consequences in terms of, of, of changes in the inventory, usually loss, sometimes new species, and it depends where and when and at the level in the food chain that you're looking at. And there is absolutely no question in my mind that the, 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 the process of, of change in the climate that we have registered in the last 25 years and the modelling that is now possible through the scientific data that has been collected, suggests that we are going to see a major episode of climate change within the next 25 to 50 years. Let's leave it as broad as that. There is absolutely no question that biodiversity has, has continued to survive, and indeed evolution, and I think you would agree with Richard, has been driven by this dynamic. And if there hadn't been climate change, there had been stasis, many of the changes in genetic selection wouldn't have occurred. And, and we must be grateful for climate change in producing us, I would suggest. The question, however, is, can existing biodiversity, banked in national parks and sanctuaries and protected areas, survive the climate change any more than island faunas have survived climate change in the past? And we have now created a dependency on national parks and protected areas covering 12%, 12.5% of the world's surface, where many of us are satisfied. We've got everything in the bank. But climate change is coming along at such a speed that much of this will probably go, irrespective of what we do in the next 10 years. And the question then has to be, asked, are any of us approaching this in the right way? And are our national park boundaries realistic in terms of what's going to hit them? Should we now not be looking at real estate? options, where in the event of certain things happening, things can be moved, even if they can't get there on their own, because there are no corridors. But the key, obviously, is time, isn't it? Um, and we all know that the, the climate of this country, let alone anywhere else, has been changing over, I mean, 200 years ago, the Thames was freezing over and we were roasting oxen on the Thames. Climate is changing, sure. But the problem, and, and, and the natural world reacts to that and moves. Bands of, 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 of uh, Mediterranean climate can move north or can move south with the uh, consequent changes, and ecosystems can react to it. But the trouble is that w what we're facing now is um, a sudden um, trip in which some, you go over just one particular boundary more, and suddenly ice caps melt. And then the, the, the change is going to be gigantic and swift. But as far as I can see, none of us, no scientists, can tell us 
just which way that is going. I mean, if someone's going to say, okay, uh, the south of England is going to be the Sahara, and uh, we, we, therefore we ought to think about what's happening in Scotland. Well, maybe you could. But, the, but scientists aren't even agreed whether the south of England is going to be the Sahara or the Arctic. I mean, uh, we, we, we I, really I think, don't know. Well, I think this is changing, and I think that the, the, the degree of, of, of agreement amongst climate scientists today is far greater than it was even three years ago. And I think the, the, the acceptance of data today is at a much higher level than we've seen before. My concern is, is partly that conservationists and managers of wildlife estates are not plugged into this discussion. Mm. We're still talking about things as if we don't know about that, except in the sort of if ethereal world that you're talking about. And, and I believe it's absolutely critical that conservationists and biologists and ecologists sit down with the climate scientists and look at the boundaries on a map of where biodiversity is largely concentrated and figure out against certain modeling whether it is realistic to, to expect this to survive, as it is. I, I authored a book with Roger Lowen called The Sixth Extinction. It's not a unique title. Others have used it. But what it's saying is if the, if the planet loses a significant proportion, 70, 80 percent of, of, of living species in a short period of time, the consequences previously have been totally catastrophic. If this is likely to happen, are we doing anything about it? And it's, it's fine to be talking about beetles or elephants, but we're talking about the loss of whole ecosystems. We're talking about the disappearance of everything we have known in certain parts of the world. It, and, and I don't think I'm being overdramatic. I suppose if you, Which, if you think back to the other five extinctions, uh, some of them, at least we know, were caused by impacts from outer space, a, a major catastrophe, a threat coming from outer space. If such a thing were discovered now, if, it, if, if astronomers told us that a comet of the size of the one that destroyed the dinosaurs is heading our way, Presumably, the whole human species would start pulling together and would start getting their heads together, having meetings, trying to think of ways of averting the catastrophe. I wonder whether you could try to represent the sixth extinction as though it was an approaching comet uh, with similarly dramatic effects, whether that might galvanise politicians and the rest of us into getting together in the way that they would if it was like the fifth extinction. You said the rest of us. What, what intrigues me quite often is, as in, in my role as a you know, reporter or whatever, is that you go around and you talk to specialists, you talk to politicians, um, you talk to economists, and they all have a little touch of knowledge about the thing outside, but they operate within a very narrow spectrum of their, I mean, selfish genes at work, of, of what they have to achieve tomorrow or the next day. I've got to win an election. Yes, I've got responsibilities mm. to go beyond that, but I've got, I've got to win an election. I've got a board of shareholders. I've got to satisfy the board of, board of shareholders. I'm a scientist. I've got to make sure that the pharmaceutical company goes on, etc. Mm. Is there a way in... I mean, and you were listening then as if you were learning from what you were hearing yeah. and you weren't across it all. Was that true? Well, yes. Um, now, is there, are there ways in which people can, like yourselves, can break out of these, I hate the phrase, but out of these boxes, as it were, uh, in order to galvanise. If it is as, and I've, you know, d d you are saying things that I've heard other people, eminent people similar to you, saying in exactly the same way. Who are you asking a question to? Yeah, I'm, I'm making a statement. <laughs> <and> I... <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. Yeah, I'm asking you a question. Well, it... David, David, you're, you're, the, you're, the, you're, the, you're, you're the great communicator. Is there a way in which um, you can it is possible to bring together these uh, different sources of power and influence on Earth to raise this, which you both agree is being the potentially terrifying catastrophe for, for, for the, our species, let alone the rest? I guess every single one of us uh, and many out there have spent time in committee meetings and conferences and in talk shops, and you sit there after day after day and you think... What is this to do with the problem? I mean, uh, how can we get something done? I, and uh, lead you to suppose what Richard was saying earlier. You want an, an enlightened dictatorship to sort that out. I don't know how you do it. But I'm sure that one of the things that you have to do, which is where we all come in, is that you have to make sure 
um, that as far as possible, the electorates in democratic societies are aware of what the situation is, of what is at stake, of what the price is, and, and the sort of things that can be done. Because in our systems, it is politicians who eventually have to press the levers. And unless you get a politician who really believes that the electorate has a powerful view on this, he won't do anything. Just to follow that up, David, you've, you, you've, critics have said yes of you personally, as it were, and you're familiar with the, with the, with the criticism. Yes, you, you've been the greatest communicator that we've ever had in the, in, the, in, the, in the medium of television, conveying the wonder, the beauty, the extraordinary quality of species on Earth. And it's a fantastic gain. But you've shied away from... Um, uh, carrying through that to what we've just been talking about, saying, oh, you mustn't preach. What is your well, own feeling about that now? Uh, oh, no, well, I mean, in, in defence, let me say, I did three 50-minute 50, uh, 50 programmes precisely about this, called about the state of the planet, in which we actually put that, put that forward. Um, and, of course... Every broadcasting organisation ought to be ventilating these issues. I would wish that we did more. Um, but what we're talking about requires a, a very big changes and which will require people not just paying lip service but really believing it is too and putting things behind it. Now, that means that they ought to be converted. They ought to actually think that the natural world is precious. Um, and unless, that, is, that is step one. If they don't think that... Uh, then they aren't going to make the sort of sacrifices that, they're going to, you know, that is necessary to be made. And that's why all of us in this, in, in, in this festival are engaged in the business, I believe, because we get huge delight and pleasure out of seeing these things, and we believe they're precious, and others ought to see why that is so. I, I don't watch a lot of television, um, do but, I. but I do get the impression that there has been a great deal, and, and present company notwithstanding, a great deal of, you know, spring follows winter and summer follows spring and things get together and have babies and go on and get eaten. <laughs> and there's a certain inevitability to a lot of the nature films that we see. And a lot of this suggests there are no people in the planet. And, and I wonder whether there couldn't be more attempt in some of the films, not all of the films, there's some great exceptions, to be slightly more contemporary and relevant to the crisis that we're talking about. And I think this would take some conscious thinking. <laughs> I know that I've been criticised for being basically a political animal for, for most of my life. I am political, and I do believe politics has a place. It's, it's very much part of being a primate, and the whole business of being a primate is to get other primates to do what you think is right. <laughs> Um, particularly if, if, if you've got, you had silver hair and now it's gone completely. But you still, you still want to push your point and you have to be political. And I think conservationists have been too apolitical. We've been trying to be too pure. I think if you look at what has happened to the world in the last 15 years in terms of IT and, and, and the ability for ideas to rush through the world, good conservation points and good conservation ideas are not using those channels in the way they might be used. Now, how you get people to log on to learn those things, I don't know. But there clearly is a means of communication that far exceeds anything we've ever had in terms of film. And there must be a way that can be plugged into to make it exciting. But, but all, all those great numbers that turned up at uh, uh, Birmingham, Seattle and elsewhere to, to lobby, most of them extremely peacefully, some of them not... That wasn't because of mainstream media. That was entirely done on the, on the internet. That's what I'm saying. I That's exactly your internet point. internet is yeah. a tool that I think conservationists and, 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 and wildlife policymakers are not using. Jane. Um, yeah. The point was being made that the, the wonderful work that you originally did would now get lost in the maelstrom. Which it would, probably. Yeah, well, um, we're working with youth. I come back to that because that is my hope for the future. And this program has really started to grow beyond any dreams I might have had. We're now in 87 countries. We have more than 7,500 active groups. They are using the internet crazily every day. Uh, they're, sharing, uh, they're sharing their thoughts about conservation, about the future of the world. Their future, their future. It, it belongs to them. And we've messed it up. 
And, you know, this is why I began the program, because I felt so guilty when I look at my three little grandchildren and think what's damaged since I was their age. And that if we can't give youth hope, we may as well give up and pack up, because then there's no hope. And what's the use of my struggling to save chimpanzees, forests, ants, or anything else if we're not raising the next generation to be better stewards than we've been? So my passion is in this program. We've been talking about very you know, catastrophe at the one end of the scale, hope at the other end of the scale. On the spectrum, as it were, of pessimism to optimism, where do you find yourselves? Uh, Richard Dawkins first. Veering wildly each way and never coming, never settling in the middle. Jane? I'm definitely um, on the optimistic side because... I spend 300 days a year traveling the world, meeting groups of young people who, as I said before, but I repeat it, it's not that they can change the world, they are changing it. And we, we emphasize the value of every individual and then every individual's action collectively creates the change. Big change, huge change, happening right now as we speak. So, yes, I'm optimistic. Richard Leakey. Oh, I'm optimistic. I'm... Um... I'm persuaded, having been in, in public life, that there are relatively few individuals who actually manage the major decisions of this planet, less than 100 probably, that will determine uh, the future at any given point in time. And I think if we could find the majority of those people, it's perfectly within our past to persuade them to do the right thing. And I don't think we should be pessimistic. There are a lot of problems. But my goodness, we've achieved a great deal in the last 50 years, and I think the world is, in fact, despite the fears that I have for climate change, better environmentally than it was in much of its spread. Not all of it, but I think it can be done, and I think I, I'm, I'm definitely an optimist. David? Well, uh, the fact of the matter is that the world is changing, and the world has changed, and this lot, all of us who are involved in the media, have, will have witnessed that change. Uh, if 50 years ago, 40 years ago, if someone suggested that the ecology or conservation had to be a plank on anybody's political platform, they would, you would have been laughed out of court. And the fact of the matter is that now there are politicians, maybe ham-fistedly, maybe wrong-headedly, but there are politicians who are charged with responsibility of looking after the environment. Now, that is, that is a move forward. There are uh, international organisations in the United Nations who are also... In, in, there is an environmental programme. Now, if they had been wonderfully successful, we wouldn't be talking this way now. Of course they aren't. But we are moving. It is possible to change. And if I may say so, Richard's remark about slavery in this particular city um, suddenly struck a chord in my heart. That was, and that is really comparatively recent. It's 200 years ago. Um, less. Um, so, uh, I, of course, I'm concerned, like everybody else is here, but let us not suppose the case has yet been lost, because it hasn't. Things are moving, things are changing, and it's up to us to keep them changing and increase the pace. We must keep going, and I believe we will shift things. How far? <laughs> I think Albert Schweitzer said over 50 years ago, mankind has lost the capacity to foresee and forestall. We will end up destroying the planet. Helped along by the notion that the human brain can overcome the genetic disposition and therefore can foresee and forestall potentially, the consensus just about here is that you can afford to say, we can do it if we have the will. I suspect that's what we're saying. Thank you to our distinguished panel for your contributions and thank you to our audience for coming here and being part of what I hope you have found, as I've been lucky enough to enjoy, a very stimulating debate. Thanks a lot. Stay with BBC Four tonight for a global perspective on the big stories of the day. The world is next.